Okay, ready? Thank you. <clears throat> we are reconvening open session for the regular Board of Education meeting for Thursday, October 25th, 2018. Uh, we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask Irene Telemontis um, to lead that. And let roll call reflect that all trustees are still present. We also um, welcome Skylar Breen, our student from Washington Middle College High School. So we will now move on to announcement of actions taken in closed session. E1, Government Code Section 54956.9, D2, Conference with Legal Counsel, Potential Litigation, the Board Discussed. We will now move on to approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda before we approve this evening's agenda? You have to make them all. Hmm? She has to make it. You, you have to announce a change. Okay, very good. Um, I do want to announce um, a change to our agenda. Um, we were scheduled to have a public hearing, but because of procedural complications, we will not. However, we will be taking public comments regarding this item. And that um, item was the waiver. M1. M1. So may I get a motion? You have a motion to approve with N1 and O1 uh, moved to the next meeting. May I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimously approved. We will now move on to communications and celebrations. J1 School Report, Westmore Oaks Elementary School, Stacy Falconer, Principal. Thank you so much. Good evening, President Alcala. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Luna, Cabinet, and guests. My name is Stacy Falconer. I'm the proud principal of Westmore Oaks. With me tonight, I have our acting assistant principal, Yolanda Saka. And as you can see, several of our staff members, family members, and students with me here tonight. It's my honor and pleasure to present to you some of the things that we are working on this year at Westmore Oaks as we endeavor to meet the needs of our student population. And so very quickly, let me introduce you to our student population, uh, population. At Westmore Oaks, we serve 683 students in grades K through eight. We represent 11 spoken languages at our school, and our students are born and from 10 different countries. 82% of our students are socioeconomically disadvantaged, which means they either come from low income households or both parents did not graduate high school or both. We have 15% of our students as English learners, and 8% of our students have an identified area of disability. So with all of these needs and all of these subgroups, tonight we chose to focus our conversation on how we are aligning our work to our district LCAP goal number two, providing educational opportunities that are individualized, highly or high quality, to meet the unique needs of our student population, which is incredibly diverse. 
So that work, getting to know the culture of our students and how to best meet their needs starts with first understanding ourselves. And so this year, as we came back in August, we welcomed a third of new staff members to our campus. So one out of three certificated staff members at our campus are new to our school or our district or to the profession of teaching entirely. And so when that happens, it's a very exciting time, but it also shifts our own culture in amazing and positive ways. And so as our team came back in August, both our professional classified staff and certificated staff engaged in some PD that was about the five stages of team development because part of our work this year is launching our work as PLCs and that takes collaboration and trust and so with new team members it's important that we come together to start that forming process and norming process. We also began our school year um, in conjunction with Riverbank's site leadership team. Our site leadership team also met to engage in some cultural competency and equity professional development in August. And so both of our teams came together in the Westmore Oaks Library in August to start the work on figuring out how we're gonna meet the equitable needs of our students. Um, so we had a full day of equity training and cultural competency training under the premise that until we understand how our own culture and background and experiences influence how we see education, how we see behaviors in our classroom, how we analyze the family involvement that we have in our school, we cannot move our students along and become a successful campus. And so that's been a big crux of our leadership team's work and it's gonna continue throughout this school year. And all of that, getting to know ourselves at a deeper level, getting to know our uh, staff and each other at a deeper level, it's all purposeful towards getting to know our students at a deeper level. So knowing ourselves so that we can better meet the needs of our students. So one of the needs that comes along with having an 82% student population that's disadvantaged is recognizing that our kids are often language deprived. And I'm not just talking about our 15% of English learners, but just students who perhaps didn't have access to literacy strategies strategies and instruction in early years. And so next month, we're gonna be launching a school-wide campaign that all dragons speak scholarly. And we're really gonna be focusing this year our instruction on advancing academic language. And so our teachers and staff will all be modeling academic register at all times. We're gonna be encouraging our families and our students to do the same. And then we're also gonna be embedding protocols from kinder all the way through eighth grade, embedding structured academic discussion in all grades and all content areas so that our students not only get the opportunity to practice this language, but they're doing it in a way that's fully supported um, and consistent in all classrooms across our campus. And then of course, in order to meet the needs of our diverse population, we have to differentiate our instruction. And so the big purpose of getting to know our students on a deeper level, one-on-one, -on -one, one student, one story at a time, is being able to meet their educational needs in our classrooms as unique individuals. And so this year, as part of our PLC work and during PLT time, our teachers will be analyzing data. They'll be talking and collaborating with one another about best practices, how we can meet the needs of those students in our classroom who come from a diverse background, um, and innovating more interventions and supports for those students as well. So in a nutshell, our goals this year, one, get to know ourselves better. You cannot serve those that you do not understand, and you cannot understand others until you understand yourself. And so that's gonna be a big part of our work is becoming culturally proficient as staff members ourselves. And then also developing those collaborative relationships with one another as colleagues. Getting to know our students better, more deeply, by investigating their stories, building relationships with every single dragon on our campus and analyzing that common data so that we have something consistent to talk about and inform our instruction and all of that again to meet their needs because that's what we're charged to do. It's our great privilege and honor to do so. And so advancing that academic language to eliminate boundaries and obstacles in the lives of our students for their futures in college and career is a number one goal for us this year. And again, providing those necessary interventions and supports that we know our kids need. So basically, we know we have these subgroups. The state reminds us every single year, but our focus this year is not looking at our students any longer as a subgroup but instead recognizing that every single one of these students matters. And it's not 683 students, it's 683 individual students who are unique 
and in need of differentiated instruction because they're waiting to be known, they're waiting to be valued, and they're waiting to be inspired. And so that's our focus and intent this year. So along with our theme of getting to know you this year, Board of Trustees, our staff and students are inviting you to get to know us at a deeper level. So our two, kinder, or two of our kindergarten classes and two of our first grade classes have extended a personal invitation for you to come back and read to them again this year. And they are so thoughtful and well prepared that they even provided you a book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Door. Door. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And so we encourage you to come and read to our students at a time and date of your choosing. And then also to help you get to know us a little bit better, we've brought some of our kinder students along with one of our brand new dragon teachers, not new to the district, but new to Westmore Oaks, Mr. Buse, and some of our kinder, kinder students to sing a song to you that they have learned and memorized.
My favorite's the cup, though. The cup they gave us. I with feel. The little Just wait till everyone leaves. We will now move on to the Yolo Farm to Fork, Suzanne Falzoni. Hi, um, my name is Anya perrin -Burdick. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of Suzanne Falzone. Suzanne's our board president. I am our program manager. So first off, I want to say thank you so much for inviting us to give um, our quick presentation of our program, Growing Lunch. This is an update. I believe we presented a few years ago when we first started our program. So just to give you a quick background, Yolo Farm to Fork is a nonprofit here in Yolo County, Yolo Farm to Fork. And our mission is to plant the seeds of healthy living through garden-based learning and education. And so this is an update of one of our programs here that we work with in Washington um, Unified called Growing Lunch. And the first thing I want to say is the, the biggest outcome that we've seen from this program is that kids eat what they grow. And it teaches them about where their food comes from, the names of their foods, how it's grown. So when they go into the cafeteria, they recognize it and, and they actually consume more of the produce. Um, so their growing lunch program is in two communities. It was piloted in 2016. So we did um, four schools in Woodland and three schools in, El in uh, Washington, or West Sacramento. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Oh, I do? Oh, I have the clicker. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. Do I touch the? Okay, thanks. Sorry, I'm a little bit of a luddite. I apologize. Um, so, as you know, uh, why growing lunch is so important in West Sacramento is currently 43% of West Sacramento children under the age of 18 are considered obese. Over 60% 60, 60 of Washington Unified um, School elementary students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And many of these children spend eight to 10 hours a day on your campuses. So they are there for breakfast, lunch, afternoon snack, and sometimes maybe even early dinner. Um, and what we found through our growing lunch program and through our other garden-based learning programs is that the garden-based learning experience um, actually connects to all areas of classroom curriculum and student growth and development. And um, one thing is that it, it produces huge benefits and outcomes um, for these students with very, very little investment. So in 2016, we started um, the pilot program. It was through funding from Yocha Dehi and uh, the Sac Republic uh, soccer team. They gave us our seed money. And we started at Westmore Oaks, which you just saw, Stonegate, and then quickly soon after, we expanded to Elkhorn. The Elkhorn Village did not have a garden, so we had to build it from scratch. But the principal and the teachers and the leadership team were really excited. So um, what we did is we, what the students do is they plant specific crops 
and then they harvest those crops, they wash those crops, and then they take them to the cafeteria most of the time. Sometimes they just want to eat it right then and there, which is really exciting. And, you know, we're not going to stop them from eating the carrot because then when they go home, they're going to be like, Mom, I want more carrots, right? Which is what we want them to do. We want them to get that taste and that flavor and then to know what it is so when they grow to the grocery store, they can identify it. So for, here are um, just a quick snapshot of the pounds of produce that we've um, produced. Right now, um, we're primarily producing from Westmore Oaks and Stonegate. Elkhorn Village is right behind. Um, we do have some pictures of here of these teeny tiny carrots that they planted and they grew. Um, and as you can see, uh, just in 2016 and 2017, the last two years, um, out of two schools, we got over 600 pounds of produce. And Westmore Oaks is rocking. I just have to say, I know that, that those, those sweet little kindergartners, but they have an amazing garden that is run by... Paula Tapia over here, who was the former kitchen manager at Westmore Oaks. And she is phenomenal, what she does for that community and for those kids. And to see their faces light up um, at Yellow Farm to Fork, we call that the stickiness of learning. Um, when kids go out and experience the garden, and it's something that they remember and they retain. We also hire UC Davis and Woodland Community College interns that work with the kids. So, um, so far we've hired 14 of them and we find that to be a really amazing experience for the students to have that relationship with a, with a college student. So let me see, next one, great. So we will grow crops from arugula to zucchini um, in the winter of 2018, so pretty recently, we partnered with Rayleigh's and, and they gave us additional, they invited us to apply with the Growing Lunch Program. Um, and they gave us additional funding to expand the program to Westfield Village, in addition to Westmore Oaks, Stonegate, and Elkhorn. Um, and they also provided the funding so we could expand the experience in after school programs with the kids zone because we know instructional time is very impacted and we found that managing the garden is best done after school um, as far as making, I like to think of it as a learning lab and so you always need to have the beakers cleaned and the tools put away so that if a teacher comes out with students, then it's all ready for them to go. And um, we really like to focus our lessons on all you need is a clipboard and a piece of paper and maybe a magnifying glass. But what you really need is just excitement to learn and inquiry and, and asking questions, right? Um, so this last summer, we contracted with Paula Tapia, who, by the way, if you've ever wanted to walk around Washington Unified with a rock star, just walk around with Paula Tapia, because um, you can't get five feet without somebody, <laughs> I'm making her blush, uh, with somebody hugging her. Um, but she has been really um, growing the partnership um, of this program, along with a lot of the other wonderful kitchen managers and staff in Washington Unified that support this program. Parents and teachers and community members and, and the Kids Zone staff. Um, so let me see where my next. So what we found, we've learned a lot in the last two years, but what we found is kids who garden eat more fresh fruits and vegetables and are more adventurous to explore those options when they do go into the cafeteria. After, uh, after school programs um, are best managed when you um, coordinate with Kid Zone or ACES, an after school program. Uh, kids Zone staff and a lot of your teachers and other uh, paraprofessionals are really committed to wanting to learn more about what does it take to manage a group of students in the garden. What can we provide them with technical help? And we try to keep it as simple as possible so that it's not scary. Like, oh my God, I'm going to take the kids out. They're going to take all the tomatoes. And I say, so they took all the tomatoes. That's okay. You know, one of my favorite lines is, you're only bad at gardening if you don't garden, right? So there's nothing wrong you can do. And I try really, where we are really trying to take the fear out of it. So um, 
as Suzanne also likes to say, we can grow, uh, successfully grow more food for student meals and have higher consumptions. And Paula is a testament to that because she saw her produce bill as the kitchen manager go through the roof because students were more engaged in the food that they were taking, eating. So what we would like to do in the future, this is our goals, is we really want to provide more technical assistance to the Kids Zone staff and anybody else in the community who is interested in the garden programs at the different schools and how to engage in them. And we also would really look forward to um, formalizing our partnership with Washington Unified and, and making sure that we're supporting your goals for your student achievement in the long run. So that's it. Thank you. Do we have any comments or questions? OK. Well, thank yeah, you. Sarah. A, oh, Sarah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. This has been a joy to watch from the beginning um, to where we are now across our campuses. It's been really great. I remember walking um, these sites and now seeing everything come to fruition is exciting. My question is, um, what would, does that look like in terms of formalizing our partnership? Uh, what do you mean by that? What would that look like for us? So um, what we're looking at is, you know, we recognize that we're guests on the campus and we bring in our resources. So for example, Rotary comes in, we get donations from these and that. So what we're looking for is making sure that the water doesn't get turned off um, <laughs> by accident, never on purpose. Sure. Um, what happens if, if, if something goes wrong in the garden? Who do we contact? Um, who do we contact when we want to talk, when a teacher requests information or a principal wants to talk to us about maybe bringing in professional development services as far as science education? I have a science education background. And my whole, you know, stick is to bring and 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 do cross cross mm -hmm. pollination for a better word mm -hmm. of of concepts in science through math and literature and language arts and things like that. So, and then also who to communicate with if we do get a grant. So this Rayleigh's grant, for example, was a joint venture between Washington Unified and Yolo Farm to Fork. So, you know really formalizing those forms of communication and making sure that we are providing the service and not and 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 enhancing the educational opportunity and not draining resources that are already limited that makes sense yeah so I think it would be great then to look into a memorandum of understanding or what that might look like to make sure that those paths are um, are there because I think this is a exciting and it's great to have uh, you all here and thank you Paula too so um, that that would be um, my thought then moving forward to support them. yeah yeah anyone else okay well thank you so much and I'm really happy the kids are doing this um, with a lot of enthusiasm thank you Miss Tapia for all your work and um, I keep thinking how important it is for kids to eat healthy because of um, we, we have an epidemic of obesity mm -hmm. with our young people. So if they're learning to eat the right things, this is a good way of, of you know, just doing away with, um, you know, bad eating habits. Right. And there's also, I was going to say, you know, in that enthusiasm with agriculture. I know there are a lot of jobs federally uh, that pay very, very well. I was just looking at, um, at the... Um, brochure on, on jobs mm -hmm. and in agriculture they yeah. pay very well so to get them an early start and maybe become a lucrative career at some point yeah okay. it's a real it's a real pathway yep a stepping stone so, so thank you so yeah, much no I, I think I, I agree oh. in terms of our career pathways and we're so close to so many farms and what you do and my, my children aren't part of this farm but they're part of an uh, agriculture um, after school program on and on their campus and they just love it and yeah. it's the same thing mom I want carrots I'm like when did you want did you when did you want crunchy carrots so really appreciate everything you do and yeah. I think it would be smart and good for us to kind of explore what an MOU would look like and maybe align that with our career pathways visions over time yeah. so excellent wonderful thank you so much thank you okay okay so we will now move on to student and association reports student board member report from uh, Skylar Breen from Washington Middle College. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is my student board report for Thursday, October the 25th, 2018. Um, Southport Elementary partnered with Walk Sacramento for a walk and bike to school day. They had the, the police department, Southport staff and PTO, and the Rickettes mascot walk with students and family to school. 
Um, Walk Sacramento also held a pedestrian activity day for the first through fifth graders um, learned about pedestrian safety. Southport Elementary also has their 11th annual World Peace Rose Garden Poetry Celebration on Friday, November 2nd at 145 in the Rose Garden. Ten winning students will be reading their World Peace Rose Garden poems for the school, and they will also be unveiling their plaque for the garden that will be on display for a year. Bridgeway Elementary is having their Principal's Cafe on November 2nd. The topics will be about equity and multi-tier system support. Their parent curriculum night is on November 15th, and their college and career day is on November 28th. Westfield Village Elementary had their annual harvest festival, and it had informational booths, food, games, and a haunted house. They also received a check for $670 through their participation with the West Sacramento Foundation's All Charity Raffle. The fire department also came and spoke to their kinder and first graders about their roles in the community. River City High School's River City High School girls volleyball team showed tremendous growth over the season and surpassed their win total. Cross country ran their Metro League championship, which decided which athletes would go onto the subsection meet. The water polo team will be competing in their third place game for the Metro League water polo tournament and both teams secured spots in the CIF playoffs. Girls Tennis finished their second regular season standings and completed the Metro League singles championship and they will also continue to next week for their CIF and SJS playoffs. The football team also will be playing Laguna Creek this Friday and they'll be honoring their senior players and they will recognize cheer, band, color guard, and the, the dance team at halftime. Yolo High School still meets with parents every last Thursday of the month. They'll be attending the third annual Building a Resilient Yolo Summit on October 30th at the Yolo County Office of Education in Woodland. 25 lucky Yolo students will be attending a live performance of the culturally, oh, critically acclaimed female a cappella group Nobuntu from, Zim, from the country of Zimbabwe at the Mindavi Center at UC Davis. Um, at Washington Mill College High School, National Geographic and Impact event gave 30, or 60 free tickets and transportation to see the documentary Free Solo at Tower Theater in Sacramento. Sacramento City College just released their spring schedules and our current favorites are Spanish, art, conceptual physics, and ethnic studies. Two of our newest teachers will be attending their initial AVID training this weekend. And after that, all of our full-time teaching staff will be AVID trained. We are also having a Halloween event this Monday, the 29th at 6 p.m. to bring your kids for, friend, or for kid friendly trick-or-treating in a haunted house. Thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. Very good job. Okay, we will now move on to the WSTA report, Don Stauffer. Good evening. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't come up here with a guitar and a bunch of cute kindergarten kids, but I'll try my best. <laughs> um, um, from, from our end of the world, it still seems like classroom teachers are, and other certificated folks have been under a lot of stress and it continues on. But it seems like we're just working through things problem and by, by problem. And, and I, I do appreciate the positive approach that we're, we're seeing at the district administration level. That's helping a lot. I, I would like to give a special shout out to Sue Massey Glover, Clover, who's, um, who's definitely got her hands full as it is, but she's been uh, going out of her way to make sure she's, uh, when she's fair and, that, and she's doing everything possible to uh, help help our folks as they work work uh, educating some of our most challenging students, and so I, I do appreciate that. Uh, finally, I would like to thank thank everyone involved who took a very serious look at district policy in regards to family bond and and baby bonding leave. And I know uh, we now have a couple of, of very happy. Uh, parents to be there at 38 weeks. It could happen any day now, and so they're they're planning out the rest of the year at this point, and and they're hoping 
hoping to have a, uh, the, a really good rest of the year. And for that, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll now move on to CSEA reports. This is Daniel? Oh, not Daniel, but someone else is here. Wonderful. Thank you. Board of Trustees, this is David Ballesteros. Hello, I'm the Chief Job Steward for CSEA. So we actually don't have anything on report today, but um, Daniel wanted to uh, share his enthusiasm and his appreciation for cabinet and board on all your guys', I guess you would say, uh, transparency on all the upcoming issues. So, and also we want to say thank you to Linda for your open door policy. We really, really appreciate it, and Chris too. And with that, you guys have a great night. That's great, thank you. Okay, we will now move on to public comments. At this time, members of the public may address the board on topics that are under the jurisdiction of the board and are not on the agenda, although the board, by law, may not take action at this meeting. The board may limit the total time for public input on any topic to 20 minutes until it chooses to waive the item I'm sorry, um, unless it chooses to waive the item limit for a particular item. Individual speakers may be limited to three minutes to comment on any topic. Public comments consisting of individual charges, complaints, or derogatory remarks about any district employee are requested to be submitted in writing to the administration in accordance with the district's complaint procedure. We do recognize that for a lot of people, commenting before the board and the audience and the people watching at home on television is a nerve-wracking experience. So to try to make that as easy as possible, we do ask that there not be any applause or booing or catcalling or other demonstrations to maintain a civil discourse here in the chambers. The board respects the rights of the members of the public to speak to us regarding matters on the agenda and other matters within the jurisdiction of the board. However, it is important for members of the public to recognize that comments regarding students other than the speaker's own children may during a public board meeting may be legally actionable as a violation of student privacy. Both state and federal law prohibit the board and others from discussing confidential student information in open session. To this end, be advised that if you reference a student's name other than your own student, you will be out of order and your comments may not be protected by the privileges to protect public speech. You could be found liable for such comments in legal proceedings. Furthermore, it is important for the public to understand that negative or derogatory comments made against district employees or others, even those made in public board meetings, may be actionable civil defamation. As such, the board reminds the public that the district has existing board policy that allows the public to lodge a complaint against a district employee. This policy provides a comprehensive procedure for reviewing and responding to public comments, complaints. This process provides a more thorough opportunity to be heard than is allowed under the open meeting law that governs this meeting. And we do have some public comments. Thank you. Uh, Laura Jamison. Good evening. Um, quick question, because items N and O were pulled, should I make a comment now? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the either of requesting a waiver or holding a um, election, my recommendation is to apply for the waiver. Um, I think it's just money wise, it's not worth the expense for one election. So that's my recommendation. Um, my comments tonight are gonna be kind of centered on transparency and communication. Um, kind of, I'll start with the good. Um, first of all, there's a couple of things that have happened in the last couple of months, and I want to say thank you. I think it's been a really good way to communicate with the public. Um, number one was the online survey that was sent out on the forums. I think that was a really good approach. I recognize it's not a scientific survey, but it's just it's a good way to gauge community input. So I, I thank the district for that. Um, and also that the forums that were held on the redistricting, I think forums are a much better place to have dialogue than these meetings up here. Um, so it's, I appreciate the district wanting to do the forums, and I think moving forward, it's going to be a good thing for the district to have more forums and meetings. And then for the special meeting that was last week, um, it was videotaped, and the video is now posted on the public or on the uh, YouTube page. And I, I appreciate having that video or that meeting videotaped. It's um, for transparency. It, it's much appreciated. So thank you. And I do recognize that's an additional expense, but um, it, it's much appreciated. Um, now, going back to that meeting, um, it was a special meeting. 
but the public was not allowed to make a comment on that item. We were allowed to comment before the district staff made their presentation, and I'm fairly certain that's a violation of the Brown Act. Um, section 54954.3 basically says for every special meeting, if there's an item on the agenda, then the public has the right to talk before or during consideration of that item. So I believe by not allowing the public to speak after the uh, district staff presentation, it was a violation of the Brown Act. So um, I think just moving forward, I think we're gonna be heading into some challenging times. It's just continue the dialogue, allow the public meetings, and then allow the, the public to speak during what, when we're allowed to speak during meetings. So that would be appreciated. And then um, I've mentioned this to get at uh, two by two meetings. Um, the meeting minutes and the meeting agendas are not updated on the district's website. The last meeting minutes were updated from 2016, and the last agenda is from 2017. So um, if the district's website can be updated with the two by two meeting information, that'd be great. So, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Danny. Danny Langford. Good evening. So myself and many other community members have asked time and time again about test scores, especially within this last year. Because I never get any answers, it led me to do some research on my own. In going to the website um, from the state called the Local Education Agency Account Report Card, this came up and it's very disturbing and appalling. The fact that we have out of 11 schools, eight in program improvement, that's not okay. It's directly on the sheet from the state. We have four that have been in program improvement for five years now, two for four years, one for three years, and one for one year. Granted, this is 2017, 2018 data, but it's still here. That's very disturbing. We've never had that in the history of the district, had that many schools in program improvement. In contacting the state, I know the dashboard or test scores will be rated and designated for program improvement. I assume looking at these numbers, we'll have or have we heard if we'll be targeted for assistance in that list. I'm also assuming that the ESSA is replacing, as stated on this document, um, that's replacing No Child Left Behind. That would be my guess. In looking and comparing test scores over the last three years, which I did my own little graph, we've made no progress. Yet we spent countless, probably in the millions of dollars on consultants. We've added staff, like assistant soups. And what do we have to show for it? This is very concerning. And if you guys didn't know these things, that's even more concerning. If you knew it and you did the evaluation for the superintendent that you did, that's even more concerning. When I mention consultants, what's been the result of the safety consultant? I know Ms. Kirby Gonzalez referenced it at the candidate forum. Where's that report? Because I haven't seen it come before the board. It's certainly not been made public. Has staff, teachers, administrators, have they been trained? What exactly are we getting for our money? Before former, group, uh, former board member Cruz left, I saw on the in future agenda items, a FICMAT report. I've yet to see that on any more of the agendas for upcoming issues. Is that something that we're following up on? Because I think it's highly needed. Has this information not been released because of the upcoming election? And if you truly want to hear from the community, if you truly want to show that you have a heart for the community and what they have to say instead of shutting us up or holding us to three minutes, why are you holding your first forum on the election night? That's ridiculous, that's ludicrous, especially with the huge election that we have coming in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Ortiz. Good evening, uh, President Alcala, uh, members of the board and Superintendent uh, Luna. Uh, I'm Jesse Ortiz, Yolo County Superintendent of Schools, and i just uh, making my rounds to the boards uh, here in Yolo County. As you are aware, I've, my tenure expires as a Yolo County Superintendent in about less than nine weeks. 
And I'm here tonight just to thank the board for giving the opportunity of the district office to work with the Yolo County Office of Education. Um, I have to say it's been a pleasure to work with uh, your district staff and uh, close to my 37 years in public education, it's been a very, very big pleasure to work with uh, Superintendent Linda Luna. Um, just very quickly here, I wanna say that the County Office of Education over the last uh, four years, my tenure, have really focused on equity and I think we've uh, We've made a dent, but there's a ways to go. Areas of focus that we've had are primarily the programs of the County Office of Education, and that's the Alternative Ed Program. Some of you are maybe aware that in my first six months, uh, we closed down two schools and opened up Sessa Chavez Community School. And there is a site here at West Sacramento, and that's supported by your district and obviously the board. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we're one of the few counties in the state of California that have accredited both our community school and juvenile hall detention center. And that is something we, that was a focus that I immediately we wanted to get back on uh, in terms of looking at quality. Special education was a primary focus. I heard that very loud and clear uh, during my process of the election, uh, in particular in the Davis area, where we felt, they felt uh, there was more need for community and family engagement. I think we've done a great job there at the County Office of Ed, and there's two uh, committees of special that meet on a monthly basis. Again, there's always room for improvement. And last but not least is the Head Start. One of the, my focuses as the county superintendent was to try to get those Head Start classes back <coughs> into the districts and to the local communities. We're almost there. Here in West Sacramento, there are uh, <coughs> seven or eight Head Start classes uh, that are uh, in, in your district. And uh, in uh, July 2019, all Head Start classes will be in the school districts or in the community. So that is something we uh, really have focused on too. One of the commitments I made as the running as a county superintendent of education schools here in Yolo County was the need for preschool. I think if there's such a real, real uh, way of looking at education reform and it shows it works, it's preschool, quality preschool. Here in Yolo County, uh, we have about 4,500 children that are three and four year olds and about 50% of them attend preschool in Yolo County. That's not acceptable if we really want to do education reform across the state, across the nation, and in Yolo County. So though I will be retiring as a Yolo County Superintendent of Schools, you can expect me to be back here asking for the board's support for an initiative in two, November 2020 on quality preschool across the board, looking at a quarter cent tax, which would raise approximately uh, over $8 million to make sure our children get the preschool, the quality preschool they need here in Yolo County. So I just wanna, I'm here just again to thank you and thank you, uh, Superintendent Linda Luna. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, very good. We are now calling um, for the public on the waiver. So I will, Laura Jameson, you already spoke on that, so good. Okay. Um, Maria Grijalva. Thank you. Hi. I'm uh, sorry to uh, know that you had pulled the, uh, uh, the resolution that you were going to adopt today uh, to uh, waive. I hope there are no uh, bad consequences for us fiscally. As you probably know, I think that we should apply for a waiver. We should have voted on that today. I'm sorry that that's not happening. Um, the reason that we need to ha do a waiver is because simply because we need to uh, uh, save the money. It would be just really sad and almost ridiculous for us to have to go to an election. I think uh, the resistance to adopt uh, re neighborhood representation is uh, obvious and I'm really sad to see that resistance. And so anyway, I'm sorry that this uh, adoption, is, the resolution is not being adopted today, and, and, uh, but please uh, do the waiver because we wanna save money. We don't want to uh, spend money on litigation. Thank you so much. Irene Telemontis. Hi, my, 
My name is Irene Tomantes, and I'm requesting a fee waiver. Thank you. Thank you. Don Stauffer. Hello again. Um, at this point, the district will be moving towards district elections. I mean, that's just the way it's going to be. Um, that train has left the station. So I urge you to um, pass the resolution as, it's been, as it was proposed. Uh, going to voters will not change the outcome. The district's moving forward with district elections one way or the other, and moving forward with the waiver would potentially save the district lots of money. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll now move on to um, our consent agenda. I have one public comment on the consent agenda. Dean, Dean um, Des Deskin? Decker, I'm sorry. <clears throat> thank you, thank you to the board and everyone present for your time this evening. My name is Dean Decker. I'm the vice president of sales for the Ray Morgan Company. Uh, you know, as your copier vendor and technology partner for the past five years, we've always tried to do the right thing for the district. So for that reason, I'm here to ask the board to postpone making this decision this evening and ask the district to look into this matter uh, at a deeper level. <clears throat> Fairly recently, uh, the Ray Morgan Company was one of two vendors uh, awarded the State of California mandatory copier contract. Uh, if the district were to piggyback off that contract, it would save the district an additional $60,000 over the contract that you're considering ratifying t this evening. Uh, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm just asking for what we feel is the best interest of the district and, and equally important, a sense of fair play. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So are there any changes to the consent agenda before we approve the whole consent agenda? Okay, may I get a motion? So moved. May I get a second? A second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimously approved, thank you. So we'll now move to board governance. And there are no items for governance this evening, so we will now move to um, board, board and superintendent comments. So we'll begin with Sarah Kirby Gonzalez. Okay. Um, so first I wanna make it clear in case it was confusing at the beginning. Um, the comment that was made about pulling the waiver for next meeting, it was a procedural issue that there was. And so um, that is what President Akal was alluding to, and it will be on the very next agenda. Um, that is why it was pulled for, for those process reasons. Um, I want to congratulate everybody with All Charity Raffle, who um, I saw lots and lots of Washington Unified uh, schools and organizations um, that got some money from that. So thank you to the West Sacramento Foundation and to everybody who bought tickets in our community. I am looking forward to the CSBA Equity Network meeting, uh, which will be all day uh, Friday and Saturday. Um, Vice President Wong and I represent Washington Unified on that Equity Network, and it is an honor to do so. And um, really good uh, conversations in that room, hard conversations to have, important conversations to have about what equity looks like and what does that mean for our state and for our district. And um, thank you to staff for the facility meeting. Lots of really good information there, and I am um, glad that that was uploaded so that we can share that to um, others as we go forward. And important things to look at in terms of uh, how we do our, uh, how public comment is done for special meetings, I think is um, important to look at for us. And um, with that, I have no updates in terms of the curriculum or anything else. Um, I will say that we, um, Many people heard about there was a bicycle accident in our community, and um, I know that nothing is scarier for a family than to um, hear that their child has um, been in an accident, and it's an area that I drive by every single day. And um, I have seen, actually, um, accidents, one on Merkley and one on Southport over the years since I've been on the board. and. Um, my grandfather didn't have a helmet on, and he um, didn't survive a bicycle crash. And so 
Uh, very, very thankful that that young child was wearing a helmet. And when I drove by that same intersection today, there were three students riding their bikes without helmets on. And so I want to remind one, drivers, of course, to be driving safely. Um, there are areas where the light comes in just so, mm -hmm. right at school drop off, and it's hard to see, and to be slow and diligent. And also to our students to wear their helmets. And um, if you don't have one, our schools will help you get one. And also, just because you're in the crosswalk, make sure to make eye contact with the drivers as you ride your bikes. Look them in the eyes. Make sure that they can see you um, as you ride your bikes because um, we want to make sure that everybody is safe on the road. And I'll just end with a comment that I had. My understanding was that there had been a traffic report done, a recommendation made. I went and looked through the uh, notes on that at the city and there was a stop that was going to go into Oakland Bay, which is near Bridgeway Island. And so I don't necessarily think that that needs to come to the two by two meeting. If we can just get an update on that, um, then I think that would be appropriate. So if we can have an update from the city, um, I know our parents were really pushing that on if the Oakland Bay uh, crosswalk, if that will be going in, my understanding will go in 2019. And so it would be nice to have an update on, on what that is and where exactly it is for our families um, as we continue to make sure that we have safe areas for our kids because it's of the um, utmost importance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kobe Pizzotti. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I would just like to thank the people from Westmore Oaks for coming out and giving us that update and having the kids sing to us. I mean, that's always something that I really love is seeing the children come. And, you know, it makes our job up here that much more rewarding is to actually see the kids learning and, and actually coming, displaying some of the skills they learn in, in school. And they're so darn cute. So it, it's really uh, awesome to come see them uh, or have them come see us. So um, with that, I, I, I don't want to go on and on. Sarah made some points that I would basically like to echo. Um, and then uh, let's see, just as for events, the facilities uh, discussion was really enlightening. And I wanted to think, well, he's stepped out, but I wanted to thank Chris for um, putting on such a, 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 an informative um, a, a slideshow and discussion so that we could uh, really get an understanding of where we are with our facilities. I think it's really important <laughs> yeah, right. that we understand where our space is in, in, in our district and how we are <clears throat> utilizing them. Are we utilizing it effectively? And, um, you know, if so, how can we utilize it more effectively if we need to? Um, so with that, thank you, Chris, for putting on a great show on, uh, on the facilities discussion. I appreciate that. Um, uh, last night, I was able to attend um, a birthday event for Senator Pan with uh, my colleague over there, Sarah Kirby Gonzalez, and of course, uh, WSTA uh, President Don Stoffer and uh, CSEA President Daniel Gandara was there, um, as well as uh, other city leaders like uh, Oscar Villegas was there, former trustee uh, Katie Villegas was there, uh, uh, city council member Chris Ledesma was there, and I think uh, city council member Bab Sandin showed up afterwards, after I had left, but I heard that she showed up. But it was really good to see that our community was well represented um, at a fundraiser for uh, a senator um, that represents us. And it was nice for him to choose some place in our community to host that event, which I really appreciate. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Senator Pand coming across the river and hosting at Yellow Brewing Company uh, an event. So that's about all I have. Thank you. Um, Jackie Wong. <clears throat> Thank you, President Alcala. I don't have a whole lot to uh, actually address. Um, I do want to make a comment about the SARC reports, which are outdated as they are required as 
um, as part of the national the NCLB, which is was is no longer um, federal law. ESSA is, and that was codified in 2016, and that's actually very antiquated data. Um, I know some folks weren't here at the last meeting where I, I, I kind of updated folks about the Title I conference and how inspiring it was, um, and that um, data is to be used as a continuous cycle of, of improvement. And in California, it's about equity. What does that mean for our subpopulations? Um, for those of you who are interested in actually looking at the current data, you should go to the California dashboard at um, www.caschooldashboard.org um, on the CDE website, which has more cur current data and actually um, shows progress that we've made over time, up or down, so that to try to create transparency in the system. And that's only in part just in all transparency, and my, my last job helped to uh, create it and design it. So for transparency, those who are actually interested in looking at the data, but I really urge folks to think about um, the local control funding formula, our obligations to subgroups and equity and um, low income students, English language learners, because I think we, if you look at the data and the investments that we've made strategically, we've actually invested in English language learners and they've actually increased test scores. And that was intentional, right? Um, I, I also know that over the years, even before me, it's actually statutory required to actually look at the data and we do it every single year. And of note, um, it is on a future board agenda item um, on dis for December 13th, 2018. If folks want to um, have questions and poke around the data, would really love to kind of get the community feedback on, on our progress made or um, what we need also need to do to um, address equity in this, in this community. So I wanted to kind of um, put some information out there that may be more, a little bit more current and interest, you know, um, the public may be a little bit more interested in that. And so I also know, lastly, is that we've actually made some investments in special education and students with special needs. And that's, and we've also kind of seen some progress in the data there too. If folks want to look at how we're actually spending our dollars and being strategic about our investments um, for our subpopulations per, um, per statute and intent of the legislature. Um, with that said, um, I'm going to take a, a small point of privilege because my um, my niece is actually watching. She was curious as to what school board members do, so she's logging online tonight. And I said for her birthday, I would actually wish her a happy ninth birthday. Um, and I cannot do that without also wishing my daughter uh, um, Genevieve a happy 10th birthday because they are born a few days, um, a year and a few days apart. So hello, Abby, and hello, Genevieve. So um, this is what I do this for you guys. And hopefully, um, you I made you proud tonight. Should we sing happy birthday? Oh, no, no, no. No need to sing happy birthday. OK, thank you. And um, I, I just want to say that we really appreciate the, um, the public comments. We learn much. Um, your input is very valuable to us. <coughs> and with that, um, I will go on to future board agenda items. R1, board handbook, first read, November. Oh, Linda, I'm so sorry. Superintendent Linda Luna. <laughs> Thank you, President Alcala, Board of Trustees. And normally I would forego it, but I have too many shout outs to give today because there's been incredible work from our teachers uh, these past two weeks. Um, before I begin my update, I just want to take a minute to clarify a few uh, pieces of information. And thank you, Trustee Wong, for um, clarifying in regards to where we should be receiving um, our data. So in terms of the No Child Left Behind Act with the program improvement, which no longer exists, um, that act began in 2001. And yes, Washington Unified ha had schools, a majority of the schools and program improvement that dated all the way back to this program of 2001. Though the, though the old data says five years, that does not mean it was five years. There were many, many schools across California that were 10, 15 years as program improvement. And so the five is the maximum amount that they allow on, on the, the actual data, it, but it, many, many schools were between five and 10 years of program improvement. In terms of our test scores, I would be remiss if I did not uh, clarify that our, our teachers and our students have made incredible progress with the new accountability system. Two years ago, River City High School doubled their test scores in language arts and mathematics, doubled. Now, while they are maintained last year and this year, they are looking at needing to grow more, 
doubling their test scores and a new accountability system was huge. Westfield Elementary, the first year um, in their accountability, they grew over 30 points. Now they have a long way to go, which is why we're no longer looking at the old system where it's very punitive. This is about making progress and Westfield School is the only school that has made the most consistent progress in language arts because of the heavy lifting they're doing in ELD and uh, language development. So I would be remiss if I did not clarify that because our teachers and our students are working too hard for that. In terms of our safety plans, Board of Trustees, you know that the safety plans are due to the state in, on March 1st. And we in Washington Unified have made a commitment that we are not going to wait until March to provide a safety plan that we're living throughout the year. Knowing that, um, we have our consultant who has been working with our schools and currently our safety plans are being reviewed by our police department and our fire department after the consultant has worked with every single principal in putting our safety plans together with the new information. In terms of the FICMAT report, the board got a very thorough uh, report on the FICMAT um, reports and those are available at any time should anybody like to review them. So with that, um, I would also be remiss, although Superintendent Ortiz is no longer in the room, he's been a really wonderful county superintendent to work with and has really helped our district um, to, in professional learning and also just support systems. So we wish him well on his next endeavors. Wanted to let you know um, that last evening, I'm hoping, there we go. Last evening, River City High School took a very courageous step. And the courageous step was uh, to partner to really talk about the hard things. And the hard things is about how do we connect with our students who are historically um, underrepresented and not, uh, not connected within our public education system, and that's our African American students. In terms of the achievement gap and opportunity gaps across the nation, African Americans are the one subgroup of students who fall behind in, in both of those areas. So River City High School is taking a proactive approach and they're using Kevin Bracey in a very different way this year where he's working as a, um, in a mentoring a small group of young African American men. Now it's not just African American, they have other students that have joined this particular circle of, of students to get the mentoring directly from Kevin Bracey. In addition, uh, Principal Moisich has brought in here Sandy Holman, who's the founder of the Culture Co-op, which co-op means uh, stands for caring, optimistic, open-minded, people, and it's really about understanding and respect for equity, diversity, cultural competency, and literacy. So these are the beginning baby steps to really trying to connect to all of our students with a diverse background. So it was a very small group of turnout, even though 50 people had committed to come. I guess the World Series is pretty important. I don't know. Um, but that said, she, um, Sandy works with our whole county, and she is also the one who facilitates the young African-American youth leadership that we have hosted and sponsored uh, for the past three years. So we welcome her to Washington Unified, and she's got lots more work to do with us. So I wanted to give the biggest shout out to our professional learning day that happened on October 19th. And um, so it was very, very focused under the lens of um, services and strategies of a multi-tiered system of support. We had high attendance. Um, high attendance because we had our very own lead teachers, administrators, we had a social worker, we even had a parent come in and facilitate workshops for this professional learning day. We had overwhelming responses from all who participated that it was one of the best professional learning days they've ever had in our district. It was amazing. And so I have proof of that because I also attended um, and sat through many, many courses. There were 27 courses offered. In those 27 courses, they were academic, social, emotional, and also behavioral support. So with that, 
Uh, we started with a keynote speaker. The keynote speaker was Micah Studer, who is now the Executive Director of Equity and Support Services at the Yolo County Office of Education. A very, very dynamic speaker. He's also working with our administrative leadership in their work in equity. So the keynote address is why equity, and we've, this board has talked about equity more than many, many school boards across our nation and across California do, so we give kudos to the board to talk about this important work. The reason why we talk about equity in this keynote address, here are my, a couple of my takeaways, that equity is not a pendulum. So we know in, in education things go back and forth. Should we be standards aligned? Should we be whole, uh, whole language? It goes back and forth. But what we know is that equity doesn't go away because students come with various needs, and that has been since the beginning of time. We also know that equity has to be talked about because it's counterculture counter to our culture of sometimes we punish kids for who they aren't or what they aren't, and we don't mean to. There's not, it's not the intention. But the counterculture of equity is about valuing our kids for who they are and what they bring to us. And the question for us to really think about is, is do we kick kids out who are counter to our own culture and our own expectations? The other thing that was important was about data. Uh, data really hasn't changed in a very long time, and that's a sad statement to say. Because in terms of data, the academic achievement gap has existed for too long and for many, many years. And it's still the achievement gap represents kids of color and those less fortunate. While we work earnestly, earnestly to try to address this, what we know is that we have data we have data. And what I loved in this particular uh, keynote was that instead of being data driven, we need to be data informed because what that word informed means, it's a call to action. Being informed means we're responsible now. And so uh, those were some of the keynote there. So I'm just gonna go quickly now. So in my professional learning day, uh, these were five of the courses that I went to, and I put the, the names of our facilitators because you'll recognize many of those names. These are really stellar teachers. Sarah Baum came before the board to talk about uh, the work and the system that has been put in place for suicide prevention as a social worker. So we uh, had our directors even provide um, staff development, and Jerry there is talking about restorative practices. We had our Teacher of the Year, Stephanie Kugler, talking about uh, relating primary sources to secondary sources. So we had a mixture of teachers, of secondary teachers with primary teachers. We also uh, want to give a shout out to, to Ginger and Morgan, where they talked about student discord. This is more about academic discourse, about the conversations that they have in instruction. And my last class was about engaging classrooms, and this is Pamela Akahan, and I got I wrote the word inspiration there. She was inspirational. I left that classroom wishing I could go back to teaching again. She is amazing. If you have never been in her classroom, that is one classroom to actually go and visit because the kids will be engaged in incredible strategies. She gave so many strategies to teachers that they could take them the next week and implement them. She was amazing. And you'll love her classroom too. So finally, I just wanted to close my update because I've been hearing that there's been some chatter in regards to our district budget. So the board has been so well versed in terms of the budget and um, we know that what the budget cycle is and um, in our June report, you read the narrative, you went through the adoption of the budget, you went through the adoption of the 45 day revise. So I'm here to clarify the chatter. Um, and this is nothing new either. So we just wanna make sure that the message is consistent and clear. So in terms of our school district funding, and this is not Washington Unified, this is California schools. Our local control funding formula, the LCFF, is fully funded this year. And we've been used to getting a lot of money. We've been used to getting new money for the past six to seven years because funding to public education has been slowly restored 
but slowly restored to a minimal level back to 2008. So it's the minimum amount that public education is to receive. And that's what we've been restored to. The second thing about uh, now to know is that moving forward, now that the, uh, our funding is fully funded, moving forward, that means school districts are going back to being funded only by COLA increases. And that was a long time ago in public education. I mean, when I first started as a teacher, that's how we received raises, was by a COLA. Now, COLA means something different in 2018-19. COLA might be a 2% COLA, but the operations of a school district budget is far beyond a 2% increase of funding. It is far beyond by operations, by the increases of salaries and step in columns and benefits, and more importantly, the uh, uh, reductions that are going in the state in terms of going to the pensions, the funding to STRS and PERS that we have had to shoulder in a state system. So for Washington Unified, here's how our district budget is being affected. We haven't had a decrease in enrollment this year. And when we adopt a budget in June, those are all projections. So what we want to make sure, you've heard uh, lots of chief business officials say um, a budget is fluid, a budget is uh, uh, projections and guesstimates. Well, that is true. And that's why we have a budget cycle. So we have, we project in June how many students are going to be in our district based on what has happened in the past three to five years. And so by building our budget out, we projected that we would have more kids. We've been getting 75 to 100 more kids in the past couple years. Well, this year, we not only didn't get 75 to new kids, we lost 100 kids. And we've talked about that in terms of my goals of why additional after-school care is one of my goals. So it, is that part of K-12 education? In this community, it is. It is. Because we lost kids because of after, the lack of after-school care for our families. The second one is the internal debt. And you've heard this uh, more transparent now than ever before in our district because this is a finding. And the internal debt of our district was a 30-year commitment made back in 2004 that the brand new River City High School campus would be built through, through commitment of developer fees, which is revenue into the district, to be paid for 30 years to pay off our high school. Well, it's hard to project how things are going to be in 30 years when a commitment is made. And so at this time, the developer fees are not coming into the district as was projected when this decision was made on the building of the new high school. And we have had to take money out of our local control funding formula to pay that internal debt. An increase of enrollment of special needs. So while we're decreasing the total amount of students, we're increasing the amount of students that are needing special services. I believe we received about 42 to 48 brand new students with special needs, which means those are a huge additional cost. While we welcome every child into our district, the funding for those brand new students is not going to be there. For we know that the federal government isn't even funding special needs as what they committed to. And I think I have one more. Uh, actually, the, and we have increased our spending on instructional support and resources for our students. And it's a good thing. Because it was stated before, yes, our students in our schools were in program improvement. It wasn't working. And it was curriculum from 1999. And we cannot use that kind of material. And we, ask, we have asked our teachers and our administrators to change with the look of public education to more standards alignment 
and to addressing the multi different levels of support needed. And so you have to invest in that for where else would our monies be going. And I think the last one is just the increase over time, and that's just in any organization. The, though this is Washington Unified, the only thing that is not in every single school district is that second bullet of internal debt. Other school districts do not necessarily have that. But that is unique to us. And it would be remiss of us, it would be unresponsible for us to not address that in today and, and to make a plan for the future. So that is um, an update of what you've already been receiving. And so those are our talking points. This is a part of what we would be, what we'll be doing in all of our community forums as part of the district budget update to what it looks like and how we have to be very cautious and um, restructure our budget to meet the needs um, and be fiscally responsible for the next few years. Thank you. I have a yes. quick question. Um, and it's not really a question, it's kind of semi-rhetorical because you just put up the slide in budgets that had, um, you know, it was talking about how we're only seeing COLAs from here on in. That means we're stuck at 2008 levels, mm -hmm. no matter what the cost is, because the cost of living only addresses, um, you know, the inflation for the following years, right? So we'll always be 10 years behind. So if, if, especially if you look at it in those terms, um, unless somebody is generous and decides to give us more, like the legislature and the governor and decides that's the way it's gonna go. But there was a gentleman that came up, a VP of sales on a contract that really kinda, it, I, I wanna say it irked me a little bit. Um, because from what I read in our briefing was that apparently his organization was $6,000 out of whack with what the low bid was. Am I correct in that? So we, um, in, first of all, the Ray Morgan contract expired. Right. Um, in this past spring. So while we were seeking a new CBO before putting a long-term contract in place, um, we went a month-to-month -month agreement. And um, Chris uh, Mount Benitez and his staff went through a review of all of our state um, agencies that allow us to go through without having to go out to bid and piggyback and lease also. Mm -hmm. And we took the most fiscally responsible um, contract, which is what we brought forward to the board, the right. least amount of a contract to meet the services that we are asking. Now, the Toshiba one that was in the consent agenda, they're a new company to us, and it's not a five-year, 10-year term. This is a short-year term, so we could see and ensure that they are meeting the needs of our district um, in terms of our technology and also in terms of our uh, copy machines and our printers. So we are taking the most fiscally responsible contract um, forward to the board whenever we do this. And if not, then we will do the explaining prior to the board approving. Right, thank you. And I, I knew that would be the answer, but I just want it to be public. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have any other comments? No? Okay, then we will move on to future board agenda items. So we have um, R1, Board Handbook, first read, November 2018. R2, Budget Study Session, November of 2018. R3, Student Progress on California Dashboard for 2018. R4, Annual Budget Organizational Meeting for December 13th of 2018. So I will now move to adjournment. May I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. May I get a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.